You know, we're moving into uh, deep into the last one third of the book of Mark as we're preaching verse by verse through the book of Mark. If you're new to Calvary, uh, you should know that that's kind of what we try to do is we try to give you what God gave you. Nothing more, nothing less. Try to open that up, expound that, help you understand that, and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Uh, you don't need to hear from man, you need to hear from God, amen? amen. And so uh, we're looking at Jesus in the garden in Mark chapter 14, verses 27 through 52. Uh, it's often been called his agony. Out here there's a picture from a former member of the church of Jesus in, in the garden of Gethsemane. It's often called the agony in the garden, and there's good reason for that because Jesus suffered tremendously, and we're going to look at that. So this is what it, the text reads, chapter 14 of the book of Mark, uh, verse 27. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, and after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. And truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster cries twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will not disown you. And all the others said the same. Verse 32, they went to the place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Now, this is a big theme of Mark's account. All four Gospels talk about the Garden of Gethsemane. But Mark tells us about the deep sorrow and pain that Jesus endured. And he talks more about that. Going a little farther, verse 35, he fell to the ground and portrayed, I mean, and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass for him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned and found them sleeping. Right? And his disciples found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Verse 38, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. How would you say that, right? Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, and here comes my betrayer. And then it goes on to move into talking about Jesus being arrested by Judas. And we'll just dive into this a little bit at a time. But as I was thinking about this, this passage, I was thinking about um, a couple things. That kind of, you know, the, the title is Bedtime Prayers and Betrayal. Two things that you would never think would go together, but that's really what's going on in this passage. Jesus is, when he should be sleeping, saying his prayers before he goes to bed, he's staying up all night praying. Have you ever been in that situation when it's so heavy on your soul, you're staying up all night praying your bedtime prayers, just continue on through the night? And that's really what Jesus is doing. And served up with that instead of the cup of mom's love of tucking you into bed at night and say goodnight and a kiss and all that, or dad's hand of firmness and saying, I love you, I'm watching over you. Instead of those things, Jesus is on his own. The major theme of this passage is his abandonment, okay? His abandonment. That's the major theme that we're going to look at. He's, he predicts his abandonment in the beginning. That's the first part. Then he is abandoned. Everybody just blazes. They betray him, right? They just run in all directions. And he's alone in his agony in the garden, all alone in that abandonment. And then eventually the betrayer, Judas, comes around. And he's abandoned by their betrayal because one of them actually truly betrays him to the authorities. And as I was thinking about this, you know, my mom had a, a picture when I was a young man that she hung in her room. It was above my brother's bed, my brother Don's bed. It was a picture of two kids. You've probably seen this before. <clears throat> An older brother that's maybe like seven years old, a younger sister that's like four. She's got a little, little cuddly bear in her hand or something like that. And they're walking over a broken bridge over a river filled with rocks and a waterfall. And just looking at it, you kind of cringe as an adult. Well, as a kid, you cringe too. But over both the kids, as they're stepping over these broken planks and trying to avoid falling through, is this angel, this guardian angel. And I remember my mom saying, this is just a picture when you're young. She said, this isn't what it's like, but this is a picture of, of God's watching over you. 
And the book of Luke says that an angel of the Lord came to Jesus in his agony and strengthened him. What Mark talks about, how, how horribly he's in agony and pain and, and suffering internally, and we'll talk some about that. An angel Lord is sent by God to strengthen him. That's how bad it is for him. That's how bad he suffered for you and I. And the other piece that came to my mind is, is where Peter says, I will never, right? Have you ever had that time in your life where you said, I will never, right? I remember when email came out back in the 90s, right? And they were teaching it in college. I know that makes me old, right? They were teaching in college. And I remember learning some about email and thinking, I'll never do this. This is stupid. Right now, email is a, a regular part of life. Or Facebook, when it came out, I fought that for years. I will never do Facebook. That's idiotic. I'll never do Facebook. And now we do Facebook all the time, right? I mean, it's just part of how we communicate to each other. Or maybe you said, I will never do something else sometime. I will never eat green beans as a kid, right? You cannot make me eat those Brussels sprouts, Mom. I will never eat those. And now you turn around and you shove them in your mouth for your kids and say, Mmm, this is good. Eat this with me. <laughs> right? And your mom's having the last laugh from heaven or maybe across from the table saying, Yeah, I told you so. <laughs> and so we look at both these things, this, this, this bedtime prayers of God being there with Jesus, but at the same time the betrayal. And, and we're just like Peter. We say, I will never, I'll never fall away from you, Lord. But don't we truly fall away from God all the time? Don't we really turn on him and betray him often in our walks with the Lord? And that's just one of those things. Now, as we approach this this morning, like I said, the big pressing theme is abandonment. Now, they are in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, to set this up for you. Gethsemane means olive press. And it's on the Mount of Olives that we just talked about in the previous sermons. <clears throat> so if you're at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, you went out the temple, you went out a certain gate, the Temple Gate, you went down the valley, across, and up to the Mount of Olives. That's where they're at, and there's a garden there. Now, I used to think when I was little that that was like a, a big, huge valley. It was like the Grand Canyon. Actually, it's like a big ditch. That's what the Kidron Valley is like. So it's not that far of a walk, and over 15 minutes you're there. And the book of John tells us that Jesus often went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, and to be alone. So some scholars think that a friend of his owned the garden. So it's a place where olive trees are grown, it's plush, it's green. In Palestine, where it's, where it's a desert, it's plush, it's green, it's, it's life, it's filled with olives and all that. But I think the name Garden of Gethsemane is very apropos because in the garden where there's an olive press, to press the press the olives to give you olive oil, Jesus is pressed in the garden. Jesus is pressed by your sin and mine. He is pressed as the sin bearer. He is pressed into action to do the Father's will to save you and I and all humanity for all time. Jesus is pressed. He is crushed in from all sides. And, and when he's under this pressure, he does what's natural, which is healthy, to pray, to receive strength from the Lord. And so I think there's some great takeaways that we're going to get from this this morning that are very applicable to your life, that if you're feeling press today, I think today in this passage, you're going to find fresh strength here, right? Because, because regardless of the pressure, because of the cross in Christ, Jesus has made a way for us to withdraw that strength from God the Father. He's made a way for us to have peace with the Father. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now about this agony in Gethsemane, it's a prelude to the agony of Golgotha when he's on the cross. Spurgeon said this, it's worthy of an angel's tongue. It takes Christ himself completely to expound it. May God, by his own spirit, explain it to your heart. Guess what? You guys don't have a holy angel. You just got a fat old white guy to expand it to you, okay? So you don't have that blessing. But we're going to do our best, right? You don't have an angel. You just got me. Luther once said, I feel as if Jesus Christ died only yesterday when I read Mark's account. He said, it's so fresh, it's so real, that I feel like I'm right there up against it. And I hope you feel some of that today, right? So this general theme of abandonment, right? So let's kind of, first part, we're going to understand his suffering. And two, we're going to apply his suffering to our lives, right? So that first principle is Jesus, when we're understanding his suffering, is Jesus predicted his abandonment, right? Chapter 14, verses 27 through 31. He predicts to his friends that they're going to leave him, right? Verse 27, you will all fall away. That's categorical. That's pretty tough stuff. If you're one of the 12 that's standing there, you know, Hey, come on, Jesus. 
Come on, we just had the supper together. We're all together. You said one of us is going to betray you. Now you're saying we're all going to be gone. What are you saying to us? We've been your men this whole time. We're your, your, we're your posse. We're your homies. We're your guys. We're the ones who hang with you and, and live with you and, and went up against everybody else, the Pharisees and everything with you, and we're going to be there by your side. But Jesus says, you all will fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, and he, and he quotes Zechariah 13, 7. He tells them, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Who is it that strikes the shepherd? The shepherd is Christ, right? In John 10, 10, he says, I am the good shepherd, and the sheep are those who follow me. But it says, he will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. The question we have to ask ourselves in a careful reading of the text is, who is he? Is it talking about Satan? No. It's talking about God the Father. God the Father, in his will to save you and I from our sins, had to have the penalty for his wrath paid in full. And God, in his infinite perfection, within the Trinity, decided somewhere in eternity past that Jesus Christ would be the one that would bear all the sins of the world. And so God the Father strikes his own son, so to speak, by putting him on the cross with his will. Right? And I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. And so all his closest people take off. Now, before we're too harsh on these guys... We've got to understand something. If we were there, we would do the boogie-woogie too. We would run for our lives. They knew what it meant when all the Romans and everybody showed up. They knew that their lives are going to be taken. And when you're under that kind of pressure, people buckle, even good people. You know, this idea, though, I want to help you out a little bit with it. This idea of falling away, that Greek word means to, to stumble, to fall. It doesn't mean to be gone forever, to abandon permanently. It means to stumble, to fall. So he's telling them, you guys are going to, to run away from me. But then verse 28, but, before, but after I have risen, he's telling them he's going to rise from the dead, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. He gives them hope, right? Right after he says, you're going to run from me, he gives them hope and he says, and when you get to Galilee, I'm already going to be there. In other words, you guys are going to come back to me. You're all going to fall away and stumble but you're going to come back. And when you come back to Galilee, guess what? I'm going to be the first one there. I'm already going to be there waiting for you, right? And, and I think probably if I was standing there at that time, that kind of one did one of these things, right? It's like asking your teenager to go look for something in the pantry. You know, they're so caught up in whatever else you're saying, they just, ah. And I think they probably missed that. But Jesus was trying to encourage them and give them hope. And then Peter declares, even if all fall away, I will not, right? And you think Peter stands alone? He doesn't. Back in Mark uh, chapter 10, if you remember, the, the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee, James and John said, Jesus said at that time, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die and raise three days later. And they said, we're with you all the way, right? Just like Peter, we're all in. We're with you all the way. But as it gets closer... And as the pain comes down the pike, they don't make it. Even if all others fall away, I will not fall away, Peter says, right? It's, it's this idea that I'm going to be with you. I'm the one. I, I am tough when others are not, right? I'm going to be there. Peter's not saying that he's weak. He's saying that he's strong, right? And I think the essence here is something that we can learn from, and that is that Peter in his own arrogance, in his own self-pride, he's disagreeing with Almighty God. Just think about it for a second. How many of us have been there? God tells us something and we say, not me, right? I remember God talking to me in my soul when I was a young teenager about serving in ministry, and I remember telling him, I don't see that. It wasn't that I was against the church or doing ministry. I loved it. But I just had another path of psychology and some other things. I, I didn't see that. Lord, I can't see that, right? Not me. It's crazy to argue with the Almighty. And Peter is saying here, I'm not going to fall away. Everybody else is going to fall away, but I'm not going to, right? And then what's Jesus say? Truly I tell you, verse 30, Jesus answered today. Yes, tonight. Emphasis, right? Before the rooster crows twice, 
You yourself, Peter, will disown me three times. And Peter comes back at him and says emphatically, even if I, I, I will die with you, Lord, he says. There's no way. He just misses exactly what God's saying because he's so caught up in himself, his own arrogance, his own pride. Peter disagrees with Jesus. And even though Jesus is quoting Scripture that he's fulfilling the prophecy and he's telling him all these things, Peter's still not getting it. He argues with Jesus and Jesus looks at him and says, I'm looking at you, you're the man. And Jesus has to rebuke Peter. He has to say, you're going to deny me three times tonight. But Peter protests emphatically, no way. They're not all the same. I'm the one that's different. However, as we're going to read, Peter will crumble like a folding chair, right? Before a little girl that will say, hey, you're one of those guys. A simple little girl around the fire. Peter's going to cave. He's not as strong as he thinks. And I think you and I can learn some things from this. If you go to Israel, my best friend Scott took a trip to Israel last year after his son's death and if you go to Israel, the place where the Church of St. Peter's at has a, a marker that has a picture of a black rooster with a cross on top of it and an arrow pointing to the church. Even to this day, what Peter did is marked and is seen in the church. And I think we all get it, right? He thinks he's going to hold, but he's not going to. He cannot hold because he doesn't have what it takes. So I think there's some application here. I think there's some warning and hope. The warning is, why do all these people fall away? Did Peter genuinely love Christ? I think so, absolutely. He did. He genuinely loved Christ. He believed he wouldn't fall away, but the problem was his pride is self-reliance. He doesn't understand that he's frail, that in the flesh we are frail, that even in our strongest moments we are not strong. I remember a friend of mine who was in Special Forces, the 10th Mountain Group at Fort Carson. I asked him one time in a private conversation, I said, you know, you guys do that SEER training where they train you to withstand torture. They, they lock you up in a four-by-four four box and they strip you down and they make you go without food and sleep deprive you and do things to you so that you can withstand torture. You, man, you're like the best soldier I've ever met. You're up for it. And he looked at me like I was an idiot. He just looked at me and he said, Greg, given the right conditions... Everybody fails. Nobody can withstand torture, given enough conditions. It was a humbling thought for me. He was like the toughest man I'd ever met, the best warrior. Could kill me in a second. He was a man. He was a man's man. He had seen 500, 500 instances of combat in a 10-year career in the war on terror. And he said, given the right conditions, we all fail. Because the flesh is weak, Right? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We don't understand our own neediness. And they didn't understand it themselves. And they don't understand that the enemy is within themselves, right? And Luke adds a few chilling words on this. The Luke in account of this is Jesus tells him, Peter, Satan has asked. Actually, the word is demanded in the Greek. Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. He's going to do you in. But I have prayed for you that when you've turned back, you will be the one that will strengthen the brothers. Can you imagine if you heard that, Jesus saying it to you? It should bring chills all the way down to the center of your spine. But Peter's bold and he's brash, not me. And the enemy that we have is not from without. It's our own flesh that is weak. We need to be aware of the danger of self-reliance. Proverbs 16, 18, my grandmother quoted me all the time. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That is a great thing for a young man to learn. Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 28, 26. The one who trusts in himself is a fool, God says. Self-reliance, spiritually speaking, is not healthy. We need to watch and pray. Remember the, the lesson from the end times teaching Watch and pray. Be on your guard. And then he comes into this chapter here, and Jesus says it again. Stop and watch and pray. And the guys do what? They sleep. Jesus is saying, watch and pray. And then it's filled in in some of the other, the other kind of uh, gospels, and they say, why, why are we watching and praying? He says, stay and watch and pray so that you may resist temptation. That's the modus operandi we ought to live with, being on our guard against our own flesh and against the world. 
and being watchful and praying and asking for strength that God can give us that we don't have ourselves. Later on, P- Peter, at the end of his, his own letter, would say this. He learned the lesson, but it was down the road after his failure. He says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. He further on goes on in chapter 5, verse 7, to say of 1 Peter, Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Sound familiar? Be sober-minded, be watchful. The very words that Jesus said to him multiple times. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, stand firm in your faith. That's the spirit we should walk in. Sitting in Christ, not in our own self-reliance and pride, but in Christ alone, we have the strength to handle the things that we need. To lean back into Jesus, right? Murray McShane, the young pastor who died at the age of 29, the Scottish pastor, said, the seeds of every sin known to man resides in my heart. If we say, that can't happen to me, I can never do that, guess what? It goes back to 1 Corinthians. When you stand, be careful lest you fall, right? If you say, I can never do that sin, don't lie to yourself. The seeds of destruction lie within you. Any of us could do any sin at any time, given the right conditions and not enough strength. Take heed lest you fall, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. But there's good news for the fallen, right? There's hope. By God's grace, it's not Peter that's remembered for this. What is Peter remembered for? He's remembered for being the strength, the rock, the stone that the church is built upon, right? That's If you've fallen today, you should get encouragement from this. Jesus is the God of the fallen. He gives grace to the humble. And, and Peter fell and he fell hard. He denied Christ. I don't know the man. I don't even know what you're talking about. And he runs away. And the book of John tells him that Jesus is looking at him when he says it. Can you imagine saying that? You're looking at your Lord and you say, I don't know him. But when he turns back, he is strengthened by Christ's prayer. And he becomes the strength and the rock of the disciples. He is exactly what we need, right? There's good news and hope for the fallen. His testimony should encourage you, right? This isn't like baseball. In baseball, it's how many strikes and out. Three strikes and you're out, right? Jesus doesn't do that. He's a great empire. You get over and over and over, right? And he lets you walk. He's the God of grace and goodness and mercy. Write this down. Failure is not final in the Christian faith. Failure is not final in the Christian faith. If you think you've made it in the Christian faith, you're going to mess up. If you think I'm pretty broken and not doing a good job, congratulations, you're with the rest of us who are the same way. That's the daily experience of the Christian walk. We're broken, sin-filled people, right? And the good news is, the hope is, that God strengthens us. In fact, the book of Hebrews chapter 4 says that he sits at the right hand of the Father, Jesus does, and that he intercedes for us. He intercedes for us on a daily basis, right? And it says that we should boldly approach God's throne to receive grace in time of need. That's a beautiful thing. Prayer works, right? Amen? Prayer works. We need to seek God on our knees, Right? We need to seek God on our needs. It's a beautiful thing. But Mark wants us to know that all the sheep scatter. That Jesus is going to the cross utterly alone. He poured into his disciples for three years. And when it comes time to die, they blaze. Gethsemane would involve abandonment and more. The second part, verses 32 through 42. He's going to have agony in his abandonment, right? Right? Verse 32, then they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he goes on down in verse 34, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to what? To the point of death. To the point of death. Luke fills it in, and Luke says that he's praying so hard that he sweats large, not small, large blood down his neck. He's so intense. His agony is so great. So what is his agony about? If Jesus says, sit here and watch him pray, and then he goes, a stone throws away, the book of Luke tells us, and he gets down, and what he does, it's interesting because each of the Gospels fill different things in. 
The normal way of praying when you're intense was to stand with your hands and head towards heaven and to pray towards God. That was what you did in the synagogue. That was what was normal. That's what the Pharisees did. And Jesus probably started off that way. But then one of the, the gospels says that he fell to his knees. And then eventually another gospel says that he was on his face. What kind of agony takes you from here to here to on your face? It's something heavy. It's something intense. It's something that you're praying so hard about that you go without sleep. You're going without food. I mean, you are eating the Lord's Supper, but he's not taking you now. You go without your friends, and you're solely focused on, on the Father to give you strength, and it's so intense that you're pushing blood out of your vessels and out of your body. What kind of intensity is that for? What is that agony all about? That drops of blood, Luke twenty two forty two tells us, came down his neck, right? What was that about? Well, I'll tell you what it was about. It was about he was the sin bearer for you and for I. The sin bearer for you and I. And the cup that he talks about in just a few verses later, he says, not my will, but your will, but if not, I'll drink this cup. The cup is the cup of God's wrath. The Father's wrath against your sin and mine. Exodus 37 says that he cannot allow the guilty to go unpunished. A, a just, righteous, good God cannot allow those who are against him to go unpunished. Right? If a guy breaks into your house and he destroys your home, steals all your goods, and violates your family, you want justice, and rightfully so. And you want justice swift and severe. Maybe at your own hand, which would be wrong. But you want justice when we violate God, he demands justice in his perfection of his character. And so what Jesus is carrying there a little bit, where he goes down a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour would pass from Abba, Father, that, that Daddy, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Verse 36. If there's a way to do it in another way than the cross, Father, I'm in. In his humanity, in his humanity, he struggled. And he said, Father, if there's another way to do this, I'll do it. I'll do it. But if not, I submit to you. I'll do whatever you want. Right? That's the agony that he was in, that he's, that he's not up against the, the torture of the cross. That wasn't the agony. Or that he's going to be bloodletting and, and he's going to be scourged and mocked and all that beaten. That wasn't the agony he was up against. The agony was that he was going to be separated from the Father. Do you remember the seven saints from the cross? Right? One of those saints, Jesus looks up and the darkness covers the whole earth. Jesus looks up and says, My Father, my Father, why have you what? Forsaken me in the perfect relationship that they have as God within the Trinity. At that moment, the Father's going to look away from the Son as He bears all the sin of the world. And the Son knows that's coming. And He can't stand that idea of not being with the Father, not being one with the Father. And He's going to bear all the sins of all humanity, billions and billions of humans for all time. And He's going to have all of that thrust upon His soul. That's a lot to carry. That's a lot to live with. And so that's what pushes out the blood out of his blood vessels, right? That is what gives him great grief. Mark says he was greatly distressed. He was troubled. He was alarmed. Another one translates it. He was astonished. Very sorrowful even unto death. These are echoes of Psalms 42, 6 and 11 and 43, 5. Nothing like this had been done before. And there's nothing else like it in ancient literature. If you think about it, you know, the ancient Greeks, they looked death in the eye and they laughed, right? Socrates drank his hemlock and laughed it up as he died, right? You make your hero the big man on campus. You make your hero the guy. The Roman centurions face death head on and they thrust into the battle and they die. If you're a skeptic of the Christian scriptures, this is one reason why it's genuine and real. The hero, the story, Jesus Christ, isn't up front drinking the hemlock and thrusting his sword into battle. He is suffering in agony like real human beings. And if you're going to write something that you make up, some religion, you wouldn't write the hero of the story being weak. You wouldn't write him suffering. 
you would write him strong and powerful. And that's not what we see here. We see true life. We see a real person, Jesus Christ, in his humanity in agony of all the sin that he's going to bear, right? And he just he can't almost handle the cup. But he prays, and the Father strengthens him. The book of Luke says he sends an angel to strengthen him. Was he surprised that the cross was coming? No. He knew that the hour was coming. He just said that. And he's predicted it three times. And he knows this is the way to the cross. And he told them, this is where I'm going. But the, to be the sin bearer, to have all that coming down the line, it was almost too much for him. The wrath of God fully poured out on him. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The great exchange. He became sin, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. What a great, powerful thing that Jesus did for us in this agony. He fulfills Isaiah 53. He is the suffering servant. That it, the Father was pleased to crush him. I quoted that last week for you. Jesus is going to drink in the cup. And so when, he's, when we look in a couple weeks at the, the cross and he spends six hours on the cross, he's drinking in the full measure. The night before when he's flogged and he's beaten and he's stripped and he's hurt and all these things, he's drinking in the full measure of guess what? What you and I deserve for our sin. But instead he says, I love them so much. I'll take it in their place. Verse 37, then they returned to his disciples and found them asleep. Simon, you know, he doesn't call him Peter there, right? He calls him Simon. Are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for an hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Then he goes away and he prays again. The same thing. Father, take this cup from me. Sounds like Paul praying three times. Take the thorn of the flesh from me, right? Of 2 Corinthians 10 and 11. And God says, no, this is my will. And he comes back and he finds them sleeping because their eyes were what? They were heavy. Verse 40. And they didn't even know how to answer him, right? You weren't doing what I was asking you to do. How come you weren't doing that? I don't know. They didn't know how to answer him. They're just crashing and sleeping. Verse 40. We're returning the third time. He said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, and here comes my betrayer. Jesus was abandoned, and he was left in his agony all alone, just him and the Father. He's shuddering. He's falling to the ground. He's staggering. He's bleeding. He's sweating. But is there another alternative? No. Now, what I want you to think a little bit about with a careful reading of the text is, do you see a response to any of his prayers in the biblical text? You can read all four accounts, and you hear nothing back. Was Jesus answered before? Yes. Remember when he was baptized? This is my son whom I'm well pleased with. Listen to him. Voice audibly from heaven. You don't see that here. Jesus suffers in his agony and he suffers in silence. The father does not answer him. It's begun. The time has come for him to drink in the full measure of our sin. And, and at the end of the day, he's alone, right? Until he says on the cross, it is finished to tell us that it's all done and so the agony continues and these guys do nothing to help him out now i want you to think about this just a little bit as we apply it at the end okay hold on to that picture of prayer and the effect of prayer third thing is his arrest right verse 43 as they were speaking judas one of the twelve appeared with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests the teachers of law and the elders now the betrayer who had arranged a signal with them the one i kiss is the man Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Now you can see if they got guards and stuff, more than likely there's Romans involved in this. Mark is speaking to a Roman audience, so they would, they would get that, right? Going at once to Jesus, verse 45, Judas said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near to his sword struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear, right? And Jesus said, am I leading a rebellion? that I've come out with swords and clubs to, that you have to do these things to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching the temple courts and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. And a young man, this is very interesting, wearing nothing but a linen garment, was following Jesus, and when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Jesus is arrested, and when he's arrested, he's fully abandoned. 
It says that they all fled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. Verse 50. He is completely abandoned. Jesus must drink this cup alone. No human can do it with him. And what is that like to be betrayed, right? You ever been betrayed by somebody really close to you? Oh, yeah, I hear the groans in the crowd. Absolutely. I remember two business partners that were friends of mine, and one stole $150,000 from the other and took off. And guess who he took off with? The man's wife. My friend never recovered from that. It broke him so bad he never recovered from it. He never has been the same since. He's a shell of the man he once was. It just crushed him. Can you imagine Judas, the one who dipped his hand that Jesus said, I love you, and he's, and he's eating with him, and he's doing the Lord's Supper and all those things, and he's going to forgive him and all that stuff. And this guy comes and embraces him and kisses him, looking him in the eye, betraying him. Can you imagine that? Reminds me of 2 Samuel, one of David's 30 mighty men. He walks up to this guy, and he says, my brother, and he grabs him by the beard. And then he thrusts a sword right up into him, and he drops dead, it says. That's exactly, in a spiritual, emotional sense, what Judas did to Jesus. My Lord, my God, boom. And Jesus knows it's coming. He's not taken off guard, right? And this kiss, this prearranged plan, identifies Jesus as the one that will be betrayed, and they take him into custody. Now, his men, he's not taken by surprise, but his men are taken by surprise. And in a momentary outburst, one of the disciples drew his sword, verse 47, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear, right? Where do we get who that is? We hear that in one of the other gospels that it's Peter. Bold, brash Peter. He grabs the sword into action. And then it tells us who this poor, this poor slave is, this poor servant, Malthus. The book of John tells us Malthus is his name, and poor Malthus is just doing his job and loses his ear. In another one of the Gospels, Jesus picks up the ear and he heals the man. Even in the midst of his agony, his betrayal, without sleep all night, betrayal, pain, all the way to the world, all these things, he's doing what? He's still thinking about other people. I think God includes those details so that we understand that even when we're worst against him, he's still for our good. He picks up the man's ear and he heals it, and the man is whole. And he says in one of the other gospels, don't you know that I can have 12 legions of angels come and rescue me if I wanted to? In the book of John, he says, no one takes my life. I lay down my life willingly. No one can take it from me, but I lay it down. For others. Jesus knew what was happening, but his men are taken off guard. You know, Peter, put your sword away. No more of this. Luke 22, 51, he touched his ear and he healed him. Right? And on the way to the cross, Jesus shows mercy to many other people. It's just the kind of God that we serve that he's loving and he's kind. He's not a criminal. He's not a political revolutionary. He was with him. He obeyed the law, all those things. They watched him every day in the temple. They knew him, but we've seen all throughout the book of Mark that they waited and they looked for an opportunity to what? To seize him and to kill him, and now is the time. Is God the Father caught off guard? No, this is his plan. What looks like on the earthly plane a failure is plan A, God's plan the whole way. So what's the takeaway for you and I? What's an application for us? Sometimes what looks like a failure on the earthly plane in our lives, suffering and agony on our part, is plan A for your God. Plan A for you to grow in your sanctification, to become more like Christ in your character. Plan A in you for some greater blessing down the line. Plan A for you to grow greater and more godly. I remember Jerry Bridges, who died last year of the Navigators. Met him one time. I own all his books. I just bought his latest book that was written last year, and they published it. bought it yesterday. Jerry Bridges talks about the loss of his first wife and how he was losing his sight. He was battling blindness, and he's a writer and a speaker and author, and that was tough enough. And then his, his wife died. She died of cancer. And she was his strength. She was what kept him going, he said. 
And when he lost her, he was awash. He didn't know. But he found strength in moving into Jesus Christ. And God provided him another helpmeet, his second wife, that was just as great or good than the first one. She was a powerful Christian woman that helped him spur him on to do what God had asked him to do for the rest of his life. And he said he was blessed by both women that were tremendous sisters in the Lord, tremendous women in his life. One was not greater than the other, but without losing the first one, he wouldn't have been blessed with the second one. And she had certain gifts that just moved his career ahead more, that blessed other people with his teachings from the Scriptures. We don't know what it means on the earthly plane, but God's got it. What looks like a horrible washout for us is often plan A. And we need to trust the Father. Does Jesus anywhere here not trust the Father? Does he ever say a bad word against, G- against God the Father? Does he ever say, I don't know what the Father's doing? What's he doing up there? He never sounds like Job like that. His whole indication is that he trusts. He believes, right? And then there's a fulfillment of Scripture Isaiah 53, 3, he was despised and rejected by men. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment, Isaiah 53, 8. And he was, he was counted among the rebels, Isaiah 53, 12. And we see the total defection of all his disciples. They all left him and fled, right? And then there's this picture at the end, this thing that you don't find in any other gospel, verse 51. A young man wearing nothing but a, a linen garment was following Jesus. And when they seized him, verse 52, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. What in the world? I'm reading this and I'm thinking, what does this have to do with anything? I mean, really? You ever go through the scriptures, you read it, and you go, really? What's this about, God? I mean, let's be honest. Sometimes you say that. And I said that about them like, what's this got to do with anything? Well, if you're looking at it carefully and you think about it and you read about it, this piece here kind of foreshadows a little bit does a couple things. First of all, probably it was Mark himself that is this man, the author of this book. He was there, and he's afraid and shamed to write his own name. He was following Jesus at a distance after he was arrested, and they saw him, and they seized him, and to get away from him, he fled. He kind of did a Joseph. They held on to his clothes, and he fled naked into the night. Why does Mark, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, include this in the text? Because isn't this each and every one of us with Jesus? Doesn't this foreshadow, or not foreshadow, but go back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed, but then they sin, and then what are they doing? They're hiding from God in their nakedness. Why are you hiding, Adam? Well, me and the woman were naked, and so we were hid ourselves. Who told you you were naked? Well, the serpent. And he had her eat, and she had me eat, and and then the blame game begins, right? They fled in their nakedness, and we do the same. We flee in our sin and our shame. We run away from God when we should be running to him, right? This is actually what we all are like when Romans 3.9 says, we've all turned away. We've each gone our own way. And the Lord has laid upon Jesus the iniquity, the sins of us all. We turn away from God. That's the natural place for you and I. I think the encouragement of this passage is these men come back around to Jesus and are ardent servants of him. And you and I can learn the same thing. When we fall, when we fail, God does great things, right? This is what he's all about. Is is the garden reminds us of our sin, but it also reminds us of Jesus' grace. So let's, let's do a couple of applications here, okay? We need to be thinking a little bit about that God's grace is never too small for anything. God's grace is never too small for anything. His grace always overcomes our sin. His grace overcame Peter's sin. His grace overcame all their sins because eventually they all come back to him and they all go to their deaths for him. Right? That's what God does. His grace is overwhelming. It meets all of our needs. It it fixes us. When I was working with a potter, when Kim and I were first married, a master potter, he used to have me collect up all the broken pottery. And we put it in this machine, and this machine had these huge blades, they're about this long, and they go a few thousand miles an hour at sea, and they just crush it. So you put in some broken piece of pottery, and it would shred it. 
And he said, man, don't ever get your hands in there. Game over. It'll chew you all the way up to here before I get you out. Man, I was careful of that machine, let me tell you. You put that hard pottery in there, it would just shred it like nothing, crumble it into nothing. I'd say, what are we doing? You said mixed pottery. This is, we just broke this up into a million pieces. He says, watch. Add some new clay to it. Add some water to it. Mix it up. Slower in the machine. Mix it up. Mix it up. Mix it up. Add some more clay, some more water. Mix it up. Mix it up. Mix it up. Pretty soon you got this great clay. He takes it. He throws it on the wheel. He forms it into something. Go put that in the oven. I go put it in the oven. Fire it. And guess what? Looks like a million bucks. It's hard. You can put water in it. It's great. We'd sell it for hundreds of dollars. Isn't that a perfect picture of us? We're broken, just like these men. We're shredded sometimes. Jesus picks up all the pieces. He puts us in the grinder sometimes, and we go, what are you doing? You're shredding us. Wait for it. And he puts in what? His Holy Spirit and more good things. Himself mixes it up and then takes us and throws us on his own wheel and forms us into what we should be into the great earthen vessels that we could be to serve him. Man, the, the story of the garden is not the agony, but the grace. The grace. There's no one too far gone that will look towards Jesus that he cannot redeem. If we will repent of our sins, he will bring us back to him and he will strengthen us. And you know, this whole thing here where he, he prays for them, right? Do you think that when you're actively sinning against God and you're run away from him that he's praying for you? Yes. That's the whole model of him throughout the entire Gospels. Book of Hebrews says that he's at the right hand of the Father, like I said, interceding for us. It doesn't say he's interceding for us when we're doing good. He's interceding for us all the time. I think he prays harder when we're running away. Father, give them extra measures of your grace. We need to follow our our Savior's model. He learned to live on his knees. We need to learn how to live on our knees. I think the thing that hurts the modern church the most, our music's phenomenal. We have more commentaries and great preachers and stuff and all those things, but guess what the modern church lacks, and that is prayer. We're relying upon ourselves, our own technology, our own gifts, our own talents. We've forgotten how to hit the ground in prayer. We've forgotten how to live in prayer how to bathe each other in prayer, how to self-rely. And you, when do we pull out the prayer card? When there's nothing else we can do, right? Someone's got cancer. I got no power. Then to pull out the prayer card, right? My husband says he's walking out the door. He's leaving me. It's time to pull out the prayer card. I got nothing else. My kid is in full rebellion using drugs or this, that, and the other, whatever, whatever you fill in the gap. I can do nothing else. It's time for me to pull out the prayer card. How much better that deck would be if we used a lot of prayer cards at the beginning of the game than at the end, right? That would be so much wiser. Jesus teaches us that even in our suffering, especially in our suffering, we should go to the Father on our knees. When you hear the test came back, I have cancer, just like the song says, or I've lost my baby, right? I've walked with a few couples through that time that I meet them. What did you have? What did you give birth to? And you see the horror on their faces and their bodies as they're just broken people, as there was a stillborn child or it died shortly after birth. Trust me, there's nothing you got to say. So you better be bringing Jesus and his word because there ain't nothing else you got to offer. But we should be with God on his knees. One time in one of those situations, the mother and the father in a hospital room prayed on their knees with me. Very seldom have I ever felt that way before or since. That's a supernatural thing. That they said, God, we just, we're, we're wasted by this. But we'll take it, whatever you got for us, and we know you have. Well, the good news is today they got forged kids, right? God still blessed them. We need to be with Jesus when we feel abandoned. We need to be on our knees. And you know what? God gave us hands for praying. He gave us knees for praying. What about our tear ducts? He gave us our tear ducts for a reason, to cry, to release tension. It's okay to cry. 
It's okay to cry out with a loud voice like Jesus to God, seeking his mercy and his grace. He gave us tear ducts for a reason so that we do it. This is what the book of Hebrews says in chapter 5. We do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's the lesson that we need to bring away from the cross. I'm going to finish with this. C.J. Mahaney is a pastor of Sovereign Grace Ministries out in Baltimore. And he tells a story in one of his conferences of the first British doctor that contracted AIDS when we didn't really know what it was about. Before we called it HIV, it was just known as AIDS in the early 80s. He was doing research in Zimbabwe, blood-based research, to try to figure out what virus was killing these people on the nation of Africa or on the continent of Africa. And in the process of not knowing anything about it before we knew anything, he contracted it, and he was dying from it. A strong Christian doctor, and as he was dying, it got to a point to where he could, he could not speak. He could almost not breathe without the assistance of machines. And he was writing to his wife each day. She sat by his bedside. And she would write something to him, and he would write a few words and sentences. And over time, his long sentences got shorter and shorter and shorter until it was just a couple words. And then eventually, he could barely hold up. He was so weak. The pen. And the last thing he wrote to her on the day that he died was just a simple scrawled out backwards hook. And she said, Jay, Jay. She mentioned their kids' names with Jay, and he shook his head no. And she mentioned this, and no, no, no. And she kept thinking, Jay, 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 go through her vocabulary. And she said, Jesus. And he stopped, and he shook his head. When we got nothing else, okay, when we're all wasted away, the Garden of Gethsemane teaches us that Jesus is enough. Going to the Father is enough. And if we'll learn that one lesson as a takeaway for today, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin left a crimson stain. He washed me white as snow. That's one side of it. And on the other side, no matter what I'm facing, Jesus has the answer. And if we get those two takeaways, then we understand the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's pray.